Welcome everyone to Coaching in Session. This is going to be our third episode of the group episodes. And this is going to be the last episode for 2023. Came up with this idea in 2022. I said, you know, I'm going to do something special. I want to have group episodes of guests that have been on in the past because some guests are just so amazing. I said, I have to have them back. I have to have them back on because what they say, what their message is, is just so powerful. And one episode just wasn't enough. And I said, the group episodes are going to be exactly what we need. We need to have more of that type of conversation. And that is what is going to be in today's episode. If you remember our first group episode, we had all the ladies come in, talk about empowerment. We talked about business ownership with women, women rights. We talked about all of that positive nature when it comes to women showing up in their life, even being a stay-at-home wife, all powerful things. Then we came in with a male panel for our group two. That group right there, I did a little twist to it because it just wasn't all men. It was all black men. So we had a bit of culture, but then we also talked about what was going on in the world with men and then it being toxic or not toxic. And it was a whole conversation we had. It was a great episode. And today we are going to be bringing in the best of both worlds. We're going to be having a co-ed panel and we have some of the best coaches in town with us today. So we're going to be introducing those guests today, right now. My first guest that I'm going to be introducing is Carolyn Mabubi. Carolyn, please tell us about yourself and then tell people where they can find you. Hi, Michael. I'm very um, privileged to be here in this group and excited about this conversation. I am a professional life and leadership coach, and I work with entrepreneurs, leaders, CEOs, and also their young adult children. So it's a very particular niche. And I am, you can find me easily on Instagram and on Facebook at Carolyn Mabubi Coach. And also um, my website, carolynmabubi.com, where I have my journal and my articles. And if you're interested in learning more about anything I speak about today, that's really the best place to go to. And I do have to tell everyone, I loved our episode together. It was just magical. I was just like, after our conversation, I was like, well, that was good. It is hard to find good guests like yourself, Carolyn. So I want to thank you so much for being a part of this group three episode. My next guest is going to be Ahmad. Ahmad is a wonderful man. He is uh, aspiring to be even more than what he is doing great things in his life. Ahmad, can you please tell us who you are, what you do, and, and then also tell people where they can find you? First, Michael, thank you for having me on this panel with amazing people. My name is Ahmad Vital. I am a motivational speaker, a mental performance coach, and I write curriculums for nonprofits. Also being a mentor to young adults, specifically young men helping them make the transition through life. My book, Now What?, goes through the process of coming out of one area of life and jumping into a new season. And that transition, it goes along with that. Um, I can be found at amadvital.com and it's just amadvital on all the social media platforms. Looking forward to working with youth across the country, whether it's through professional ministry or just, you know, somebody's had too many bad days and a bad season and we want to Maybe bring some sunshine to too many rainy days. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I did love our episode too, because it was an episode that many young men had to listen to. And the work that you do is reflective of that because our young men, and we talked about this in group two, but our episode, you know, that we had individually was still powerful. And that's what we need. We need to have more powerful leaders like yourself. And then we have ST Rappaport. Please introduce yourself to the world and then please tell people how they can find you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I am really excited for this episode. It's not very often that you get to do group episodes like this. And I appreciate you, Michael, for putting all the work that goes into it because I know it's a lot more than what people actually see. But I am a brain engineer. I help entrepreneurs optimize their thinking so running their business is easier. Um, and you can find me on your favorite social platform at Life Picks University. So that's Life Picks, P I X University, or my website, lifepicksuniversity.com. Perfect. And I loved our episode. It was a lot of fun. Like when I was done with our episode, I was like, this was like a lot of fun. It was wholesome. It was just like you go home and you eat some home cooking. And it was just like that was a conversation. So I loved our conversation. And you are right. These episodes take a lot of love because it takes like 20 hours for me to edit this episode. 
And it's crazy. It's like 20 hours, but it is worth it at the end of it. Because when I have it done and I show it to the world, it's like, it's great. But then we're going to get into, I saved the best for last. All right. I, you know, like I love Caroline. I love you, Mamad. I love you, Esty, but I'm saving the best for last. Giovanna Elias, can you please tell the world who you are and then uh, tell people how they can find you? Hi, everyone. Uh, first off, I just want to say absolute pleasure to be here with some very fascinating people just based on the titles you shared with me of the work that you do. Thank you, Michael, for having me. I am a human connection and communication expert. So essentially, I help busy professionals learn how to consciously communicate, how to lead greatly and how to connect on an authentic level. And, you know, I say it time and time again, the quality of our lives really is based upon the quality of our relationships. So if we know how to really master and have those quality relationships and talk to each other, then I think we don't need to suffer the way we do and we can have a quality life that we really want. And as for finding me, I think the best way to see my work is on Instagram, Elias. And um, I'm soon to be releasing a new book in the fall. So I'm excited to share that with you guys on my Instagram as well. <laughs> Excellent. So a book is a lot of work for anyone who thinks that, oh, you just write you know, some words and put it on the page. No, it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of editing. It can be very stressful and it is something that many people don't do in their life. So kudos to you. I'm going to be definitely promoting that book on coaching a session so you can have so much success with that. I loved our episode too. The clips that I created and I put them on Instagram, people love them. Like I already know today is going to be a great episode because everyone is just an all-star rock star. And we are going to be talking about the three C's. I, I made it up. You want to make it a four C, we can. But we're going to be talking about conversation, conformity, and community and culture. So community and culture can be put into one. But we are going to be having a conversation on everything that is who we become, because there is a madness to my actions typically. So I didn't just do an episode of all ladies, then do an episode of all men, and then do a co-ed panel. I said, this is the madness of what I'm trying to create in 2023, because there is a separation, but then there's also a unity. So I wanted to get into the conversation of the unity of not only the sexes, but also of the world. And we are going to start with Carolyn. And like I said early on, I love to be vague. I love to leave it up to interpretation. So Carolyn, when I say that, what is something that comes to your mind? So when you talk about your three C's, conversation, conformity, and community, I'm going to leave culture out of it for the moment. What immediately comes to my mind is how conformity gets both in the way of conversation and community. And we are all here devotees of conversation because at the end of the day, what really happens? How do we, how do we help our clients change their lives? One conversation at a time, right? Like none of us goes in there and waves a magic wand. What we do is we have really deep, meaningful really life-changing conversations. And if conformity is the filter through which our clients are going through to have that conversation, or if we are using that filter, it's never going to be a powerful conversation. And when I look at community, and I have a very particular way of looking at community, for me, the right community is not like a group or a club that you know you belong to a community at its best is a mirror it holds up a mirror to you where you can see the best of yourself maybe also what needs improvement in yourself that's what a powerful community does but so often our communities are sacrificed to conformity if you do not conform to the rules of the community then you know you don't belong and you don't feel at home and you know, all the benefits that a community can really bring is lost. So that's what stood out to me. And as you can tell, I'm not a big fan of conformity because I kind of think it's the, it's the enemy of everything, but especially these two things. Yes. I'd love to know what uh, Giovanna, what came up for Giovanna as <laughs> she... Well, um, I super resonate with you, Carolyn, when you say you're not a big fan of conformity. <laughs> 
I always feel like any rules uh, I ever heard growing up, I was like, let's question those. Let's be critically thinking of all of that. And let's maybe do the opposite. Um, <laughs> but with with all that being said, for me, when I hear those words, you know, I think when we're conforming to something, for me, it feels like we're out of alignment with ourselves. And so if I'm not in alignment with myself, that's going to show up in the way in which I have a conversation. If I can't be my most authentic self in that conversation, then I'm not really quite sure what types of communities we're creating either. Because now it feels like disingenuine, inauthentic communities based on inauthentic conversations based on the fact that we're conforming. So I really think it's a matter of us, first and foremost, being aware of you know where our values are at, what's important for us. And recognizing why would we maybe feel a need to conform to begin with and maybe question that. That way, once again, we can show up in a conversation being our most aligned, most authentic, most real self. And I think that disseminates in our energy outwards. And that shows up in how a community ends up, you know, coming to form and the energy of that community itself, too. So that's that's sort of my two cents on that one. I'd love to hear. I'm seeing ST kind of nodding her head. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. (laughs) Yeah. So like you both of you shared, I too, like I'm not a big believer in conforming and never ever colored in the lines. But as you're talking, I'm like thinking like, if so many people don't like to conform, then where does this feeling of needing to conform or where does society like push us to conform if nobody actually likes to conform? And I don't have an answer for that, but I'd be curious what um, that, what you think about that. I, I do like the fact that community is in there. Community is something that I speak on a lot. And, and when I think of community uh, in the sense of where we're coming from is I feel like it's values-based and challenge-based as far as when I'm looking to build a community. Obviously, values-based, I mean, yes, we all are somewhat of a mosaic. We have different things that we believe in, different things we represent, different things in different ways we show up. But for the most part, if we look at a collective of the people who are around us, there's probably some non-negotiables in there. And what I mean by that, there's a value system amongst most of the people who we keep in our inner circle who rock with us in a certain type of way. And so when I mean by values based, I mean like, I'm not saying that our ideologies are direct, but they're not completely counter on, on either side of any debate that there is out there for the most part. And so when I'm looking to build a community, I want someone who does share at least some baseline values with me, but also want a challenge-based community from the standpoint of where am I lacking? I know that I bring certain things to the table, but I know as an entrepreneur, as a ministry leader, as uh, just a leader in general, that I'm not enough to be able to do all the things that are needed to make an organization run. Therefore, I'm going to seek out the things where I'm maybe 20% where I need 100 where I'm maybe 40% where I need the other 60. So I'm going to seek out people in the community from a challenge standpoint to fill in the blanks of where I need some assistance in making this whole thing run. And then we all win together because you're in, you know, you're in your, your expertise. I'm in my expertise and we all come together and make something happen. And so obviously the conformity <laughs> doesn't fit into that from the standpoint that I'm allowing you to be who you are and come into this organization and make it happen by what you do great. And so all three of those can absolutely work together, but it all starts with the willingness to be able to create a community in the first place. In my years of teaching, just seeing kids grow up, understanding mindset, reading books, and just working with individuals, I have seen the change. I mean, I've been in teaching since 2009, coaching since 2011. And I can tell you the shift and the shift is like the conformity began when peer acceptance became something that people wanted so deeply in their life. Think about MySpace. You have your eight to 10 to 24 friends that you can have on your front page. If you had like popular kids, people would say, oh, well, you know, he has some popular kids on. Or if you have, um, you know, just a couple few, like, you know, those are your ride or die people. And then from there, it was building of the social medias. Facebook started to come up and then we had Twitter and then all the more social medias. But what started to happen was the social media stopped saying, okay, well, you're just going to be independent, but you are also going to have the ability to be a leader or a follower. So people would follow people. 
So they'll find someone who has a similar mindset. And it doesn't matter if it's a growth mindset, it could be a fixed mindset, it could be a negative type of personality, toxic type of personality. So the community that those people build together are going to be dependent on what that leader is. So the conversation is, well, how do we build strong leaders that can lead communities that people are just not conforming to what's popular? Because if we just turn on the TV and we see, oh, this is what's happening, or if we see this is what people are wearing, or this is the latest and greatest, this is what I need in my life, what does that do to mindset? What does that do to a culture of people who do not know how to be themselves or cannot be themselves because they feel like if they are different, they're ridiculed. And I want to get to Giovanna first because it seems like you're ready and willing to go on this one. So many things that have been said that I'm like, I just want to speak to all these points. So speaking off of what you said, Michael, and also what ST said, you know, why do we conform to begin with? What leads us to do that? And I think a lot of it stems down to fear, you know, and, and it this is far more built into our system as the science does supposedly say that, you know, from tribal days, we, we survived in community, right? We did well, we thrived in community. So conformity, I think, naturally happens when there is a fear to be kicked out of those communities, to no longer belong, to no longer be a part of something. And I think speaking to your point, Michael, about social media being, you know, it's in our face. Everybody's on it. Everybody's using it, whether we want to be or not, especially us as workers. We're like posting our work up in these spaces. You can't help but notice whose eyes are on you and who's on your work. And so, you know, I think more than anything and speaking, you know, even going one layer deeper as to the leaders, you said, who are these leaders? What type of leaders do we need to create healthy communities so that, you know, people have a, a freedom to sort of be natural in those spaces? I would say leadership comes down to, you know, are you, con are you a conscious communicator? Are you emotionally intelligent? Are you creating, you know, opportunities and space for people in those communities to also be able to to lead freely. There's so many elements that go into it, right? Are you clear in the way in which you communicate? Are you conscious? Are you confident? Are you compassionate? There's all these different qualities that need to first be, be brought up in a leader in order to then lead a community well. But then speaking to the people that are following these leaders, I think it takes a very strong degree of, once again, going back to emotional intelligence, which is an awareness of how we feel, an ability to manage those feelings, and a deep sense of security and confidence in ourselves to then be able to say, I agree or I disagree, regardless of whether I might be kicked out of the tribe or not, regardless of whether anybody else in this community agrees with me or not. So there's a multitude of elements going on here. I'm seeing Carolyn... <laughs> I'm like reading body language. I'm curious what Carolyn has to say. Giovanna, <laughs> um, how to develop every person's inner leader rather than their inner follower. That's really what I'm hearing in Michael's question. And Giovanna, you're very thoughtful and obviously from your experience, very profound questions of how we get there. And I think that we have to make small changes. For example, how great would it be if instead of followers, anyone who joined your community was called a leader? So nobody would be titled right off the bat as a follower. Because really at the end of the day, Giovanna, you know better than anyone, we're all leaders. Even if we are leading only ourselves, only one person, we're all leaders that need to become better at that work. People come to coaching for what? Because the, you know they're missing the skills to lead themselves or their family or their organization through the world. So we're all leaders. And if we can reframe the whole dynamic so that you know, I'm not the leader in this community. We are all leaders coming together to help each other. I think that right there would be a shift. Um, 
that would lead to people taking radical responsibility of their own lives, their communication, their interactions with others. I saw Esti kind of shaking her head. So I'm wondering if any piece of that resonates with you. Yeah, because it's interesting. Exactly what you were thinking was what I was thinking when Michael was talking. And like literally every person needs to become a leader. The term that I was specifically thinking about was like servant leadership in combination with that awareness, right? We need that awareness of like who we are and to like really make any sort of change in your life. Like it starts with awareness. Without that, you're not going to have any change. And then to lead yourself and to lead others, you need that awareness. Now, we want to lead others through a servant way, a way of like serving them. That way you're leading the whole group together. I think that as soon as we take more responsibility through awareness, then we really can develop those communities more. So just agreeing with you. I love the idea of servant leadership. That is something that um, I definitely share with those whom I work with from the standpoint that like you are in a servant mentality while still leading. And that obviously allows others to want to follow you in that place. And while everyone is a leader, we, you know, we have to, I don't want to say jump in and out of when we're taking the top leadership spot, because we all are leaders of our lives. We're all our leaders of our homes. We all are leaders of the different individual things we're part of. But obviously sometimes we are a leader within submitting to another leader in a particular area or a particular organization, because obviously we have to have different layers and structures when we're working with other people who Maybe this is their organization. We support them over there and we're all servant leaders in this spot. But definitely the to have a servant heart, to want to do and make others better is the way you lead. And I think that's extremely important for everyone to know that, hey, I want to try to raise the boats, all the boats around me and everyone can can grow together. But at the same time, know that in certain different situations we'll be called to be a different type of leader in a different type of setting. And to have the awareness to do that is going to obviously make every organization, including our own, work better in the long run. Yeah. Jordan Peterson, he talks about this quite a bit, where he talks about how weak people are dangerous. And he's like, if if you're so worried about what a strong man can do, you haven't seen what a weak man can do. That goes into the ability to lead, the ability to follow, and then what happens to that weak individual. Because a weak person is going to conform in a negative fashion than if they would conform into a positive fashion, if that makes sense. If I'm hanging around the wrong people, for example, let's say all these people are are doing the wrong thing, right? They're just wasting their life away, maybe doing illegal things. We won't get into details. But from there, I can conform to that lifestyle or I can say this lifestyle is not for me. If I take that leadership role of me being a trailblazer, going my own path, that's more difficult than me just saying I'm going to follow somebody. So it's easier to conform, it's easier to be weak, it's easier to just find a community that might not be the best, but is enough. So people live in a life or in a mindset that's just enough, right? So they have just enough, they work their nine to five, they can barely get by, they live in the rat race. If you think about the rat race, they always have enough money for exactly what they need. So they they have to keep the lights on, they have to keep the water on, they have to put gas in the car, but they don't grow from there yet they have the opportunity to get out of that habit or that lifestyle. So for example, let's say you are in a community where you work underneath a boss or a CEO or or whatever. There's nothing wrong with helping someone with their dream and amass wealth and things like that. But is that your dream too? I think people sometimes they get this misinterpreted in, in the sense of I'm making a living, but I'm not making my life. And that's the aspect of building who you are, because the community that you build should be based on goodness in your life and abundance in your life. Because if everyone that's around you, going back to my example of if you're around people who are doing the negative behaviors and habits, that right there is going to be just a lot of people living in scarcity, a lot of people just barely trying to get by. This could be a lot of hardship, a lot of struggle. And I see so many young children, not just men, ladies also, where they will go into a crowd, go into a group, 
And then that's where they stay and that's their mindset. And so they follow an ideology that they were told from maybe their parents, maybe their friends, and then they find themselves 25, 30, and they're like, I think I went down the wrong path. It's because they didn't build a strong community. They didn't have the conversations of what they wanted to really accomplish. They just kind of did what they were told. And I'm not blaming teachers. I'm not blaming all the parents. But if we look at the world, the structure is to build worker bees, basically. Like, okay, like they don't tell you how to manage your bank accounts anymore in school. They don't teach you how to cook and home ec and things like that. It's basically, all right, here's a test. Let's see what you can get. So the community that we're building is built on conformity because everyone's just like, all right, I have to get an A. But there's people. I know there's a gentleman in, in China. He has a son. He's a wealthy individual. And he tells his son, it's okay if you get a C. It's okay if you get a B. Because if you're just trying to get an A like everyone else, then you can't focus on the real things that matter in life. So I want to get into that conversation with you, Ahmad, because I know you work with a lot of youth and you work with a lot of these young men and I'm sure young ladies, and you get to see it firsthand on the problems, on the communities that are, are being built in their minds. Man, it's, um, it's dire um, on, yep. on many levels. There's, there's some lights in the tunnels, but my goodness, there's, there's some days and I'm just like, did you really call? me into this place at this time. And I'm glad you were leaning in on conformity because you, you actually sparked something for me because one of the last papers I wrote out of college was called The Comfort in Conformity because conformity is comfortable, right? Mediocrity is comfortable because why? I, I don't have many high expectations and I don't really care if I fail. I'll just kind of float in the middle. And that's where, that's where, you know, the public school system typically is. And no one's taught to go above and beyond anything because it's like everyone's supposed to finish, you know, with this B plus, A minus average, and we're good. You know, the meanwhile, the C students are over there, you know, creating Microsoft and other things. But when you look at like the, the conformity, the reason why you conform is because there's no expectations. You don't care if you, re you don't really care if you win, but you're not really saddened if you lose because no one gave you the bump to say, you know, you can do better than 25,000 a year. And it's just like, oh, I thought 25 was all I needed. You know, I went to school with a lot of guys who were just like, man, I just want to make my 40K, have my wife and my kids kick up and have a beer when I come home. And even then I was like, that doesn't sound like an awesome life at all. But that is the way. And, and think about that was back in the 90s. Where are we now? Now there's taught so much less than that. I, I, I get Young men coming into me now and, and even the ladies and, and their expectations and their goal systems is like, wow, like it's almost like you almost have to go, oh, t like who told you that? Who taught you that life is supposed to be about this? This is why all of the entitlement programs are so appealing. Why? You're going to, I think, I think, Tom, Michael, you just said it. I have just enough to be able to eat and barely live. And really, you're not living, you're existing. No one's taught to live and thrive. And so when I come in with these young men, I say, you know, write down your goals or whatever. And I look over at those goals and I almost want to cry. And I'm like, why is, why is this the pinnacle? If you could have anything you want, why is this the max? Like some of them have never even been taught that like a hundred grand is even possible. And I'm just like, a hundred grand is too, what are we talking about here? And so when, when we're starting looking at, you know, overcoming this fear, because see, when you actually have a goal, it's like, high and measurable, the fear, the, the failure is going to come. And you're scared of that failure. You're scared of you didn't make it the first one, two, three, four, five. I mean, I'm on the, I'm on the call with entrepreneurs right now. I'm pretty sure the failure rate between us is plus 100 on different tasks we've tried. And that's okay. Why? Because we're like, hey, 101, we got this. But the way the system is taught now is they're not even taught to like, forget shooting for the, for the moon, for the stars and you'll land at the moon. They're not even taught to shoot outside their communities. They're taught to just live in these little echo chambers, these bubbles of, you know, hey man, you got a little bit, I got a little bit and we'll just, you know, make it work. And it's like, what is making it work? Like they, they've been taught to just be average. And to me, average is just disrespectful to the game of life. And, but no one's ever taught them that. Never, no one's ever pulled them aside and was like, 
you know greatness is available. You know excellence is available. You know millions are available. And you know freedom of mind, spirituality, financially, all of that is available. And so I love throwing that out there to me because conformity, uh, entitlement, all of those things are just disrespectful to the way we were built and created to do amazing things in life. Mm -hmm. And who do you want to pass it to? Ooh, we. Me and Kelly are like. <laughs> I see some, I see some, some, some giddiness. Look, I'll, I'll shift to my right and, and, and go to Carolyn. And Carolyn, I'm sure you'll slide it on down to Ms. Gio, who's down there just like, ah, about I to will. Yes. I will. Thank you. Michael, you know how when you were introducing, you were talking about unity, you were talking about how, you know, okay, you had the women's group, you had the men's group, and now you're doing the co ed. And that right there is you being a model of unity. Love, Esti, love Giovanna, what I'm learning from them. And what I'm, the person I'm learning most from today is Amon. And we're just wildly different on the face of it, right? He's a black man. I'm a white woman. I'm sure we have very different backgrounds and cultures. And yet I'm beginning to feel this warm blanket of unity wrap around me as I listen to him because I'm understanding and learning and seeing from a point of view that I don't normally. So I think that to your first question before we started about unity, how, how we create that, this right here is a great model, you know, kind of doubling down on that in every area of our lives would be really beneficial. The second big insight that I'm having, this too, you know, really came from Ahmad talking about conformity. You know, I started out saying conformity is the big evil and it's the enemy of everything. But really the connection I'm making now is that there is also a positive side to conformity if we are in a, as Ahmad said, a value-based community. So if that, if we've already passed through that filter where our basic fundamental common values are a match, well, maybe it's okay to conform and learn why, like, conform, you know, the benefits of conformity. And an example for me is I come from a very traditional background. I'm Iranian, I'm Jewish, you know, and so family and all that comes with that, I inherited. You know, we came, we were for 3,000 years in one neighborhood in Iran, and then the revolution happened. And we all moved, hundreds of us moved to the same square mile in Los Angeles. <laughs> and, you know, I was 11 years old, just going into my teenage years. Nothing could be more suffocating. I was trying to find my identity as, and not be labeled. And at that time, the hostage crisis was happening as an Arab, as a terrorist, as ugly, as hairy, as all of those things. And I did not want to be in this, I did not want to conform to my community. Fast forward to decades later, me as a single mom with two kids and a job. Guess what? The only way I was able to raise my kids in a healthy way, the only way I was able to create prosperity for my family was by, in a way, conforming to the rules of the community so that I could also benefit from all the positive things that that community offered. That's the insight I'm having. And I'm wondering if that, um, if anyone else connects here, Giovanna, if you want to take it from here. Yeah. Um, it's actually interesting that you had mentioned the positive side of, of conformity, Carolyn, because I was thinking that as, you know, Michael and Amin were, were sharing their perspectives and, and also what you had said earlier, Carolyn, about, you know, why isn't everybody leaders? And then, of course, you know, us having talked about, you know, certain people can lead at certain points in time and other people step down from leadership and, and learn from others and whatnot. And I do believe that if everybody was leading all simultaneously at the same time, it's kind of like having too many cooks in the kitchen. And it's, it's too much. It's overwhelming. And so to some extent, we can call it conformity. To some extent, we need followers or we need people that take a back seat and say, you know, let me learn from you, let me follow, let me assist or help, but I don't need to necessarily be in a leadership role. 
Now, with all that being said, that doesn't mean we can't teach people leadership qualities. So we can still maintain those qualities as leaders. We just can learn within that space as leaders when to take the role as leader and when to also step down and let someone else lead. That way we're all balancing and sharing very much like what we're doing right now. So I, I do think also the world wouldn't necessarily work or function if everybody, let's say, owned their own business because we'd have nobody working for our businesses. So, you know, to some degree, we also need these people that are, we can call it conforming or following or following a more simple lifestyle, because that also helps us leaders be able to build our empires as well. So, you know, there, there sort of is this beautiful ebb and flow and balance that takes place sort of organically in the world. And for as much as we, of course, want to bring up everybody with these leadership qualities, which I still think is so important. I think at the same time, we need to learn when to fall back and, and help others and assist others and learn from others. And then when we can also step into our leadership role. I'm, I'm just going to complete full circle on this. I wanted to actually speak and I'm going to come back to you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to say it correctly. Ahmad, is this Ahmad, correct? Yes. Ahmad. Okay. Ahmad. So Ahmad, you had also mentioned, you know, these kids not having these big visions. And I had actually worked on a native reserve with suicidal teens in Northern Canada for some time. And I simply think and what I saw from my experience is they did not have exposure to any other type of lifestyle than what was better than what they've been raised upon. And so without any exposure to seeing anybody doing anything better or greater or anybody in a leadership role, they, they, there was no belief. There's no belief it's possible because they haven't seen anybody in their space make it possible. So that's, that was sort of my two cents on that piece. I'm going to throw it back at you because I know you wanted to say something. <laughs> No, you're good. And and I I like where you're going from the standpoint. It's like if everybody is bosses, then who's working? If you think like, I mean, it's kind of like when they came out with that program, I think it was back in the late 80s, early 90s. And my mother, who's been a who retired as a teacher for 42 years, couldn't stand this rule. It was called No Child Left Behind. And it was one of the it was one of the worst failures in the educational system we've ever had, because it was basically just like we can't move forward as a class until everybody gets it. And it's just like. Unfortunately, it's just it's just not like that. As much as we would want everybody to get it, when we go out and coach, when we go out and teach, when we go do keynotes, we want everybody in the audience to get it. That's just not going to happen. That's not reality. The reality is really only 25 percent, maybe 30 percent are going to get it. And and we just sort of have to live with that because, like you're saying, there's hierarchies and it's like there's levels to it. You run your organization and let's just say maybe you have an assistant manager, an office manager. Well, they have two or three people under them. But you're over her and maybe there's a VP over, you know, this. And so there's your there's leadership pockets, there's levels and hierarchies and those hierarchies are needed for us to be able to function as a society. Because like you said, if we're all doing these great things, who's going to be a plumber? Who's going to fix our ACs? Who's going to pick up the trash? Who's going to get the carts at the grocery store? We have to have levels to this. And even that cart wrangler, he could be the leader at his home, but at his job, He's subservient and he's providing a service and a needed service at that. And so we we do want people to express leadership qualities. But for the most part, only a few people are going to like as it gets reset, top, 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 top level leadership. But there's still levels to it. And we all need to embrace all of our leaders. But we we are going to definitely always have some who are going to rise above the fray because we don't all have the same ambitions. Not everybody wants to be a leader at the level of even us on this panel. Some people we work with don't want to even do what we do. We're just bringing them to a place where they can be a leader in their life, but that's still at a level that they may see like, hey, I don't ever want to run a major platform like Michael has. I just want to have me a little small show and I want to do a show once a month. Maybe that's his, maybe that's his goal. And so we just have to be kind of mindful of that in the standpoint of leadership and give them those qualities and let them do with those qualities as they see fit. I just want to add a quick side note, maybe toss in on ST because I know you haven't had a chance to toss in something. Um, But just to add to that, I think at the core of everything, all humans want to be acknowledged, seen and heard. So it I don't think it necessarily matters what level we're at, so long as we're acknowledging people at every level that they're at. 
So I think if we can offer humans that, you know, me as maybe my the boss managing someone below me and them managing below them, I think all levels should be acknowledging everybody at all times. I recognize you. I see you. I appreciate you. I hear you. And I think that often is is enough. It, it's not even the title of your role. It's just like, I see you as a human being and you're important and you're offering me something and you're helping me with something. And I think that goes such a long way. So that's all I'm going to say and pass the, pass the baton along as to you, Michael. Yeah, because I have so much to say, like uh-huh. going back on everything that different people said. Um, first, I'm going to start with Ahmed of what you said about like the no child left behind thing. I think that is society creating this environment of needing to conform because we are conforming everyone around this child instead of saying like, okay, you work a little bit differently. Like you need a little bit more help. Not that there's anything wrong with you, but we're literally conforming everyone for this person and we're removing the individuality of, of like who they are. Um, so that's like, first of all, like a, a big problem. And I think also about like being leaders, like, yes, we all need leaders. I think that, that there's different levels of leaders, but I think we are all leaders to ourselves, right? Someone mentioned it earlier. I think Caroline, I don't remember. And I think that this developing the skills of the leadership need to happen with everyone. And that is what is going to help us take the responsibility, build those communities and really like have what we're trying to create. I think that so part of the problem is what happens is when people just become followers, there's nothing wrong with being a follower, but sometimes people will become a follower with a victim mindset. And then they're like jealous of the leaders. They don't have the leadership skills that is required or really to like have that good life that whatever, whatever your good life is for you and really getting rid of that, empowering people instead to develop those leadership qualities within themselves. Mm -hmm. I just thought about something when you started off talking about the no child left behind, we conform to the lowest level child. That's interesting because we conform to the lowest level achiever what's going to happen to everyone else? They're just going to say, well, this is the standard or this is the, this is what I have to do. So everyone else who might be excelling, they might say, well, if I don't have to push, why should I? Reality is a lot of people want goodness. They want greatness in their life, but they're not willing to put in the work. They're not willing to put in the long nights and the hardship in the no's that they're going to get from trying something or the emails or the you know low reviews because they are afraid to give themselves a chance to fail. I learned something probably like a couple of months ago. We are only so many failures away from success. You can only fail so much before you succeed. <laughs> like if you think about it, how many times will you fail before you have that win? And that win is going to be the only thing you think about. You're not going to think about all the times you failed. Yeah, maybe like if you want to reminisce, but you're going to be looking at that success as like, I did it. I, I won. Think about a kid who is learning how to swim or learning how to walk. They fail, they fail, they fail until they succeed. And they only focus on that success is that moment right there that they focus on. So we are conditioned for that fear of failure. When you're in school and you get your test back, the teacher, you know, places it face down so you can't see the grades. So you are a little bit nervous and you turn it over and you find out that you got an F and that after that conversation, With the teacher, she wants you to take it home and get it signed by your parents. So now you have to get it signed by your parents. And now your parents are going to be like, well, what's going on? Like, why are you getting F? You're not stupid. So so we do all of these little things that in a community, it shouldn't be there. Because if we look at a community that wants to help people succeed, there's going to be good terminology that we can use. And there's going to be negative terminology that we can use. And Sadly, parents and teachers use negative, and I'm not saying that everyone does, but it's a good amount that is going to push someone down low enough. And if you know anything about a rotten apple, if you keep it in the bunch, everything gets rotten. So we can have that one person that's just negative that can make everyone else follow suit. But then you have to realize that, you know what? My apple doesn't have to be rotten. It can be sweet. And so you can live that sweet life. You can go live that exuberant life. But people don't live in possibilities. They live with the circumstances that they're given. So if their circumstances are going to be a broken household, that's how they grow up. If they are struggling with school, that they're not smart and 
people say they're not smart, they're, you know, they're going to think they're dumb. And I can't tell because I, because, because I taught special ed my last years of teaching, I would go in and they would get their IEPs and a list of everything that's wrong with these students. And I'm like, what? Like, like, like really, we're just going to label these kids like this. And so, you know what I did with those IEPs? I just put it on the desk. I, I, I don't even look at them. I do my own work. And so when I do that process, I build them how I see them. So I'm building them up. We're not worried about, oh, you, you know, you're in special ed, you have behavioral issues. No, no, no. You don't have none of that. With me, you are the name of yourself. I, you know, I'm not going to like, like give any names, but you are, you are your name and you can be anything you want. So who do you want to be? You want to be smart? Do you want to be someone who's going to be something in the world? Or do you just want to be another statistic? And most of the times when you say it in a way that they understand, they're going to say, okay, I'm, you know, I'm not dumb. I can try. And that's when they succeed. It's crazy how one teacher can change their life for the better or for the worse. So we do have to have communities that are not just the teachers and the parents, but everyone around them, right? Because we think about, you know, like all the apples on the tree, eventually they're going to be mixed up with other apples from the orchard. And that is community as a whole. So we have different cultures in the world. We have uh, different countries in the world and they all are like a melting pot. What do we get? Do we get something good or are we going to get something sour? So, you know, the belief in the possibility. And then we talk about the aspect of leadership. I have people who work for me. I love to find people who are smarter than me, who are more skilled than me, who are better at the job than me. Yes, I'm better at certain things and I enjoy certain things, but I want people who are better at maybe video editing or better at, you know, cleaning or whatever, like just whatever the task is, because I understand I cannot do this by myself. I've tried. It is very difficult. You only have 24 hours in a day. You have to delegate. You have to leverage. And I have learned. I had terrible boss. I, I mean, I had some great bosses in my life, but. When I moved from Connecticut to Texas, because the community is different, I guess I have my family in Connecticut, but the people there are very different in Connecticut. I'm not, I'm not just talking about Connecticut, but there are certain places in the world where the people are very self-centered uh, and you don't want that. You want to have people who are caring, loving. They want to see you win too. And when I moved to Texas, everyone was just like, boom, 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 all happy. Like that Southern hospitality was there. And I was like, I was like, I love this. So I moved, like literally I went to Texas in April. I moved in December that quick. I was just like, I need to be in a better place. So from there, I grew crazy mentors, coaches, everything. I also had some bad leaders along the way. And I said, you know what? What makes a good leader? Did, I did my research. And then I said, I want to aspire to be that leader. And then I also give my employees leadership roles. So I'm not managing them. That's the last thing I want to do is micromanage. That's terrible. You know how much time that takes? So I don't want to be a micromanager. I don't want to be someone who's going to tell people what to do. They have so much freedom because I understand about education. I understand about the power of imagination. And I understand that my opinion is not the only opinion. And how what I think can be done better if we incorporated someone else's flow. And I know, ST, you have a great flow. You have a great way of doing things. And I want you to kind of lead off on that one. My first thing is like when you said your story about like how you would approach teaching, you know, like the story with like the IQ test. I don't know. There was this teacher um, who also she came to a new job and then they gave her a paper with numbers and all the kids names and all the numbers. And she thought it was their locker numbers. But later on in the year, like she found that was actually their IQ numbers and she didn't know that. And so she treated them on a much higher level and they literally like done way better. I think like they took their IQ test afterwards again, and it changed from that. So first of all, like, that's just awesome. But I think that a lot of where society is at today is about approaching where people are now and how they are going to stay forever. We are very much in like, oh, you can't focus. Like I'm just giving you medication or, oh, you can't do that. So like, you're never going to be able to do that. And we build systems and we give hacks and tips and try to create our whole lives around how a person is without actually helping them develop the skills to become further. Because just like you're not the same way you are when you were nine years old, the same way you are 
today is not the same way you are going to be forever. And you can break everything down into skills. And once you do that, skills are learnable. And that means you can learn them. And I think that we just need to like start thinking of things in that way, helping someone where they are today, like not all of a sudden like expecting them to do things just because they can't do that and helping them in the today, but also really helping them grow and push them into a place of where they can become. And Caroline, I'd be really curious to hear what you have to say on that. I, I, that really resonates with me, for me, whatever the right way to say is. And I want to tie it back, this concept of who you are becoming, who you can become, because it's really what coaching is, right? We're just helping people <laughs> become a higher version of themselves, become what is possible for them. And it's, Ahmad, what you were talking about when you, when you said, you know, what's 100,000? Like, where'd you get that number and made that a ceiling for yourself? It's not that 100,000 isn't a lot. It's a lot. But it's this concept that there is a number that is the end. And to your point, ST, there is a person that is the end. And I have arrived there. Yes, we do our individual work. But what's coming up for me today, and maybe it's because I work with so many young adults, is how do we combat the influence of an environment that is very focused on lowering or setting the bar at the lowest common denominator? I had to fight this raising kids because, and Amat, this is not just the, the kids you deal with. You know, I, my, the young adults that I work with uh, come from a lot of privilege. Okay. They still have the same issues. The issue of complacency, the issue of not wanting to push further, not wanting to get out of their comfort zone. And I knew this was going to be the case because I have a 21 year old and a 23 year old. When they were given participation medals from the age of two and four and six and eight and ongoing. And I'm just like, you don't get a medal for participation. <laughs> you know, and I felt like, talk about conformity, I felt like the worst parent on earth because I was saying this to my kids very secretly, you know, because everybody else was like, oh, thank you for participating. Here's your medal. And like participation is the baseline. You know, you talked about, Ahmad, like the game of life. Average is disrespectful to the game of life. Participation is the baseline. I'm not going to give you a medal for it. <laughs> it's, it is required. So, you know, for me, this, you know, that the concept of no child left behind again is about bringing our setting, you know, the bar at the lowest, lowest common denominator or, and then, you know, the craziness of the parents of my generation and a little bit younger than me to your kid gets a bad grade. They start fighting the teacher. I mean, if there's something to fight about, teach your kid to go fight for themselves. But like, we didn't do that. I mean, I did, but like what, again, I felt very left out of my parental community, the school I went to. I felt like going with my gut meant not being part of the community. And I was willing to pay that price. It wasn't easy. Who do you want to pass it to? Oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> all about like, I'm so worked up on, on this subject. But yeah, Giovanna. You know, I, I think it's so interesting, Carolyn, uh, hearing you speak and it very much the way I think is I like to go from micro to macro and macro to micro and understand concepts. I think we've gone a bit more micro right now in terms of talking about these little intricacies like participation awards and, and what that means. And I couldn't help but start thinking, what does this mean on a macro scale? You're talking about these micro pieces that may or may not lead to a certain type of leadership or raise kids in a certain type of way. And I'm thinking, okay, on a macro scale, what does this mean for us as a whole? What does this mean for humanity, for society, for our communities, bringing it back to community, right? What does this mean for leadership and the type of people we're raising or the types of conversations we're having or the things we're working towards? You know, considering all of that, what is it all for? You know, what is the type of world or society we're trying to build anyways? And so why are these micro things 
actually so important for us. Like I recognize it's important for you. Like you said, you're getting all worked up, which means it's important. So I want to understand maybe more on a macro scale, what makes those micro things so important? What are we actually working towards? Are we working towards societies with leaders? Are we working towards setting a higher standard so we build a certain type of planet? Do we want different types of conversations or connections or relationships or people, leaders? So that was sort of where my brain was going. And I can throw it back to you, Carolyn, but I'm also seeing Ahmad shaking his head. I'm curious what came up for you. (laughs) I'd like to hear from both of you. Well, Michael knows that that there's not much that repulses me more than participation trophies as a sports guy. (laughs) I think that pizza parties and ice cream socials after you just got your teeth kicked in, is a macro. It you are talking because what that ends up happening is so you just lost the game, and obviously you know that you need to be consoled or whatever. But you also, especially as a young, you need to feel the loss. What I mean, feel the loss, like you need to know. Okay, I'm I'm reflecting now. All the practice I put in, all the practice I put in, I'm going into the game. Everything I learned up to this point was neutralized by a bigger and better threat than me on the other side, and I lost. So. You're basically saying, I gave my best and it wasn't enough. And you know what? That's okay. And you need to understand and feel what that feels like. So when you go back into the lab, when you go back into your secret place, when you go back into the weight room, when you go back into that place where it's time for you to begin training again, you feel that ride home, not the pizza, not the ice cream. And what that does is if you mix that up with, you know, two day shipping from Amazon Prime, from You know, um, I expect coming out of college to make $150,000 with a degree that has no market value whatsoever. When you start mixing all those things together, it builds this entitlement to where now there's a group of people who are angry and they're 30 years old and saying, where's my wins? When you haven't earned it, you haven't put in those, whether you want to talk about the Gladwell 10,000 hours or as Michael was talking about, the, the pile on top of pile of losses, eventually you come to a win. Well, you got to endure those losses. Sometimes for some things, the losses may be weeks, months. For some losses, it could be over a decade, right? The Colonel Sanders model, the dude didn't didn't hit it right until he was, what, 67 years old, you know? And I'm sitting there like, could I wait that long? I don't know. I haven't tested that just yet. But when you talk about all of those things, we what we've removed is delayed gratification. And when delayed gratification is off the table, that's when we have the fractured society we have now. Because everybody wants the microwave. Nobody wants the oven. Nobody wants the slow cooker. Nobody wants the putting the pig in that hole and letting it let it marinate for a whole day. We don't want that. We want TV dinners. We want hot pockets, right? And so when you build a society and you build up a group of young people who have seen that type of lifestyle, well, that's where we have, you know, the great everybody wants to quit and everybody wants to only work for nothing less than $30 an hour when it was like, wait, weren't you just making eight an hour 10 minutes ago and you want a raise of 25? Like, what did you, what have you done between now and there to get that big of a pay increase? What more market value are you providing to this company, right? And so that's where I think that the bigger ramifications come from. And so us as leaders, we have to be the ones who show them the example. So when you sit across from someone and say, hey, you know, I understand I'm teaching you these different things. Let me show you. Let Come shadow me for a day, especially what I do with my young people. Hey, get in the passenger seat. I'm going to go show you what a day in the life is and what, and what it's like to grind and show them the opposite of what that looks like. You see that young man? I was driving down the street the other day and a young man was flunking his classes. He was just like, man, school's just too hard. And I'm just like, OK, what's the alternative? He's like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, you have an example of your cousin who's in prison now. You know, you have your your mom who abandoned you a long time ago. What does that look like? And I said, and by the way, you want to know what an example looks like if you continue on the path you're on? So you see that guy over there? And it, and it just so happened to be a guy in the middle of the street, in the middle of a highway in Houston, Texas, shooting up heroin in the middle of the road. Now, is that an extreme example? Yes. But if you look at the progression of how things go and you continue having this mindset, I'd rather tell, show you at 14 what the end of the road looks like if you continue on this trajectory because we have all the data in the world showing that this is what can happen. Let me show you a better way before you end up even on step three of a five-step process that ends you up over here. Yes, it's draconian. Yes, it's a bit harsh. But you know what? I'm tired of seeing young people fall through the crack too much. So if that means that we got to come in with a little bit more of an iron fist, 
I'm willing to be that bad guy in that spot because we have seen enough of this. We have seen enough of the participation trophies of the, the Charmin soft way of going about life. We need to teach the competition to go out there and earn what you get. And we have lost a lot of that because of the way things have come up, because of no child left behind, because when no child left behind means nobody moves forward. And when nobody moves forward, we end up with what we have now. And we have to do a lot of work to be able to reverse this trend because we're 20 to 25 years in on this. And some some deep rooted work is going to have to be done. And people like ourselves are going to have to go down there and get in those trenches and get dirty to pull these young people up out of these traps that they're in right now and get them to a place where they know that they got to put in the work, get dirty to earn what they want out of life. And I love where this conversation is going because we started off exactly how I knew we would start off because I typically know what people work well with each other. And I know what type of personalities people have going in because again, I worked with each of you. That's why I have to have people in the group sessions who have already been on the podcast. I know exactly your mindset. I know your temperament. I know keywords that are going to trigger you. And I know the mix that's going to either make it work or make it interesting. And so what is happening today is we have in conversation right now is that is evolving with different perspectives in our own lives. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you know anything about the group episodes, I take the first half and then I pass that to the guest in the second half, because that right there is the different perspective that we're trying to uh, reach to everyone. Because I can keep asking questions all day to my guests. They're going to answer them the same exact way. We can have a surface level conversation. But when I start to pass that baton to other coaches, other guests, then now they can ask the questions that are burning inside them or that are resonating with them at that moment. And they, and they might want some clarity or they might want to express their opinion and their self. And Ahmad, you do a great job at telling the world who you are, expressing yourself and just being true to your nature because you have seen the hardship. You have seen these young men and women go through it, live in it, and you want better for them. And that is so important. And I'm going to have you actually start off with asking the question now, like being the host of this part of the show and to ask one round of questions that are going to lead us into a deeper conversation. You know, I'm going to do something a little different, Michael, and I'm going to throw a little wrench into this as we okay. get this started. I actually, instead of saying, what do I want to know? I went to one of my clients and said, what do you want me to ask a panel of awesome people? And so the profile is we're looking at a middle-aged single mother working hard to do what she needs to do. And her question was, she wants to find out and I know I'll get a great answer out of this. What is your ideal setup for work-life balance? And we will start with, let's start with ST. Go below me. Okay. I um, like to use this from Jeff Bezos, but he's not really a very good example of work-life balance. But I think that's exactly the point. He doesn't use the word work-life balance. He uses work-life harmony. And I think my work-life harmony might look very different than Bezos's, <laughs> but I think that everybody has that that own thing. There's no way of saying like, this is perfect. This is what life should look like. X amount of hours at home, X amount of hours at work. I think it has to be able to work together and be harmony for your life and your current phase of life that you are in now. Because yes, there are times of your life that you are going to be working more than you are going to be spending time with your family and vice versa. And as long as there is harmony between them, then it's going to work for you and you are going to be okay with it. Even if right now it seems a little bit more challenging because you have to, let's say, spend more time working than you can with your family. Very good. Very good. I love, I love that answer. Uh, Giovanna, I saw you had a little knock in your... Go ahead and jump off the top rope. So Let's do this. Well, for one, I love the word harmony because I, I really support harmony far more than balance. Uh, you know, what does balance even really mean at the end of the day? Whereas harmony, I think, can resonate so much more with me. And, you know, sort of riding off of what ST said, I think regardless of Anything that's in our day, we should be scheduling in things that keep us physically, mentally, emotionally balanced. So we should have things like exercise integrated into our day. 
you know, healthy eating, quality time with people, like these quintessential things, maybe meditation or journaling or whatever it is to ground you. I think all of that stuff should just be a baseline habit the way you brush your teeth. And that way we can then find harmony in everything else we're doing. But, you know, speaking to work life and of course, personal life and balancing those two pieces, I think, like you said, ST, it's not going to be exactly a straight cut number for each thing. I think it's more recognizing the priorities in your life and where you're at. And there might be moments where, for example, for me right now, I'm writing my book. I'm giving far more hours to my book than I'm necessarily giving to my social and intimate life. But that's where I'm currently at. That is the current focus and my current priority. And when I'm not writing my book, I'm 100% present with the people in the spaces that I'm in. So I'm not intermingling these two worlds. I'm 100% present in my book. I'm 100% present with you when I'm with you. And I think that's really, you know, what a balance looks like where it's like when I'm doing this and I'm focused on this, I'm with it. And when I'm here, I'm here. And there is no interchanging and lack of presence. Otherwise, I'm nowhere at no point in time doing anything well. <laughs> so I think it's a matter of recognizing we move in and out of phases and moments in our lives. And sometimes certain things take more priority than others and communicating that. So if we do have families and something else needs to take priority, then making it work, having conversations about what that can look like for the next couple of days, weeks, months moving forwards or vice versa, and being more intentional with family and taking a little bit of time away from work. But I don't think it's so clear cut, like four hours here, four hours there. I think it's a matter of working with the ebb and flow. And when you are doing something, you're 100% present doing it. That's, that's my perspective on it. Yeah, go for it, Carolyn. So Ahmad, first, tell your client to get rid of the word balance. As you know, both <laughs> Ivana have Agreed. said, the word itself is a problem word. So whether you want to use life harmony, or in my case, I use integration, you know, you use that word, Giovanna, it's about integrating ourselves and our lives. This is our journey as we move forward. So much of the work I do with adults is helping them put the pieces of their lives back together because we learned early on to compartmentalize and you, you can't do that for very long. You can't do it your whole life. You have to integrate so that you can deliver the best of yourself. Having said that, I use a very specific practice. I call it the life buckets exercise. And, you know, I do it with my clients. Basically, they have to decide. I give them about 10, 12 areas of life that everybody will rate a 10. Everybody will say all of these are important. And then I step-by-step -step take them through choosing their top four three or four, no more. Because if everything is important to you, then nothing is important to you. And you have to understand, this is part of being an adult. You have to understand where the trade-offs are going to be for you and choose those. So for me, parenting is one bucket. Coaching is another bucket. Health and wellness is another bucket. And then relationships, four. I want to make sure I'm depositing in those preferably on a daily basis, definitely on a weekly basis, absolutely on a monthly basis, you know, and those deposits, you want those buckets to be full because guess what? There will be a time like what Giovanna is going through right now, where you have to focus on one bucket and you want to make sure that you can actually take money, take what is the opposite of deposit? Withdraw, withdraw right? Yeah. Withdraw. You can withdraw from the other buckets and those buckets are so full that you're not going to be running on empty and your people are not going to be resentful. So that's how I do it in order for my clients to have a more quantitative way of, oh, I haven't deposited in my relationship bucket in like two days, you know, to keep those buckets full like a bank account. Good. And I'm glad you all just really discarded the word balance because I can't stand that word either. The interesting thing is, is that she and I have really only worked together on grief. She and I share the fact that we both lost our father. So I was coaching her through that. So when I threw the question out there, I, was, I just threw out, you know, whatever you want. And I was like, work-life balance. I'm like, I don't even rock with work-life balance because like you all saying, life is in seasons. And, and it's funny you said the book writing because book writing season is like, that's like expanding a company. Like your mind is like sucked into a book. Anybody who's up here who's an author, like 
That is the reason why if I flip this camera around, you would see my office right now because I'm post book writing season and I still got the aftermath in here because it's just life just almost hits pause everywhere else when you're writing a book. And so I like the harmony. I like the integration. Definitely will pass this along to her. But this is this is good stuff because it's just seasons. And, you know, Giovanni, you gratefully said like, hey, that's when it's time for the people you love most. Have that sit down, take them to coffee and be like, hey, I love you all. But, you know, maybe I can't do every Friday for our, our night out. Maybe we can do every other, you know, every second and fourth. This is a season. This is important to me. So, man, I, I love you all. Can you please support me in this venture? Boom. And most people, if they love you, they will. So I think you all had great and amazing answers. I got a lot of good notes here because I know I'm on here rocking with good people. So, of course, that's going to come down. Like that. <laughs> yeah. And I think those are going to be really good answers to give her. For me, I don't think my answer would be appropriate for her because I operate in a very different mindset than uh, I think what she's looking for. I'm all about work. Then it comes to me because I understand about filling my cup up first. And then my family comes after that, then any fun. So that's just how I operate. So I will have 60% work, 25% fitness. Then I'll give a little bit to my family. And then whatever is left will be kind of fun or enjoyment. And to be honest, like if, if I go on a vacation, I'm on the beach, I probably have one, two days. I'm going store crazy. I'm like, all right, I got to go do something. I got to write a blog. I got to go do recording. I have to call a client. I have to do something. So. I just really enjoy the aspect of working, digging deep. And I know not everyone has that type of work ethic. And I don't expect everyone to have that type of work ethic. Some people, they just enjoy sitting on the beach, going in the salt water, getting some fresh air for me. Yeah, we can go hiking and stuff like that on a Saturday morning. But then as soon as I get home, I'm going to like probably be doing work. So it's just like, Again, I, I'm just super ambitious, super hungry. So again, I think my answer wouldn't be appropriate for her. And I know you have obligations, Ahmad. You are a busy man. And I was, I was uh, excited I can get you on for the time I had you on. Before you go, I would love to get your final thoughts on the group and then, and then kind of uh, you know, leave us with something. And then please tell the audience where they can find you again. Uh, first of all, Mike, you, Michael, thank you for having me on. And you ladies who know Michael, and obviously I know Michael, this is why Michael and I get along because everything he just broke down, we resonate on that. If you look through our emails, they're just like, yeah, we're good. Boom, boom, out. Like we're both kind of on that same work thing where work takes up 60 to 70% of our time. But whereas I would like to go ahead and sign off, um, I will, I will, I will go ahead and ride out through a couple of more. Um, mm -hmm. I know this is probably going to throw a wrench in in the plans here, but um, I will, I will ride out for the, for the half hour uh, with you all. It's been, it's been great. And I don't, I don't want to miss out on what some of you might throw out there. So um, mm -hmm. because will, this uh, is goodness, yeah, will, this will, is will, sweet. Yeah, all right. Sorry. It's like, if you go to the candy shop, you want to get a little bit of everything. You go to buffet, you just don't get one thing that you like. You have to taste everything. Maybe you don't like something, but like, I'm still going to try it. So I, so I, I'm excited for you to be, in this next part, because I'm sure these ladies are dying to ask you some questions and get your insight. So we are going to start off with Carolyn. You are going to have the opportunity to ask us a question and to bring that around town. So I'm not a big fan of advice, you know, not in getting in, not in giving it per se. And I think that I've been trained that way because I think really good coaches ask questions the way Giovanna has been doing so much. So in this time together. But I'm a big fan of insights. And one of the ways that I draw out insights from my clients is to read them a quote from my very handy book of quotes. When I come across a quote that just like, oof, I really feel it, I write it down. And often I just start a session that way. I say, I'm going to read something to you. Tell me if something comes up. I'd like to do that with you guys. So here's a quote from one of my favorite thought leaders, Tim Ferriss. And he says, a person's success in life can usually be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. True or false? Let's start with you, SD. Yes, I am a really, really big believer in it. And honestly, I will say probably the last like 12, 18 months, I've been focusing on that extra, like, Anytime there's a point 
that it's like, oh, I don't want to have this conversation. It's like, no, now it's a game and like <laughs> you have to have it um, because there's a reason why it's uncomfortable. All the good, all the benefit, all like the stuff that you want out of life are going to have happen after that uncomfortable conversation. And that's me on a personal level. Um, but I think if we go macro, then I think on a societal level also, I think that a lot of so-called the challenges or the issues that we're having is because we are not having those uncomfortable conversations. And we'll get where we want to get to when we can actually not like run away and not ignore and not push it under the rug and not when we're in that uncomfortable conversation, it gets challenging and we don't like what the other person saying, decide to say, never mind. But like we f- have the full conversation out is like when we're really going to get to where we want to go. That last piece of what you said really resonates for me because, you know, this, what is censoring? What is it about? If not about cutting the conversation off completely, not allowing, like, I don't know how we got here. I don't know how we got to a place where there are people who are just not allowed to speak and we don't want to hear them. We want to be comfortable in our own echo chamber. Thank you, SD. Ah, Ahmed, what's coming up for you? So I think we're, I think where we are with that is, is, is doubling back to where we opened with was fear, fear of disagreement, fear of not being liked, fear of someone saying, you know, you know, you're just wrong. Like you're, you're fearful of the confrontation because we want everyone to just sort of just come and just hug one another when no problems in human history have been solved by everyone agreeing. In fact, every great innovation we've ever had has probably come to a lot of disagreements. And so I I think uncomfortableness uh, agree that we have to lean in on those. And even though this is not the same thing, but for me, where I had to start breaking out over the past two years was um, was stepping into my faith more like just like, okay, you know, hey, you know, you keep all that for Wednesdays and Sundays and don't bring that into your regular life. and then there was a conflict I was having within myself. And I was like, no, this is who I am, right? This is who I'm showing up as. And if that is uncomfortable, like I'm not trying to make anyone uncomfortable and I'm never forceful about it, but I'm also not going to just slide it under the rug. This is my value system. This is what I stand for. This is what I represent, right? And so when you bring me into your organization, I'm not coming in there just, you know, laying some kind of hardcore thing down there. But at the same time, I'm expressing myself in a way that I'm leaning into it without offending anybody. But if I'm offending somebody, it's on you and it's not on me. Because I'm, like we said, I'm standing true to who I am. And so I think leaning into uncomfortable, whatever your version of uncomfortable it is, run into it full force with your sword and your shield ready. Giovanna. So much good stuff here. (laughs) So I always say that a conversation can end in connection or disconnection. And I think these hard conversations are actually opportunities for us to build a deeper sense of understanding in people so that we can end in connection. And I think if these conversations don't happen, then two things end up happening. One being that we don't have a degree of understanding about the perspective of the other person. And without that understanding, I think often there's a breakdown in respect. There's more conflict that can come out of it, tension, there's discomfort, there's a whole slew of things. And so I think when we lean into the hard, difficult conversations, we're actually saying I'm leaning into the end result or the end goal, which is connection. Because at the end, I want to understand you so we can connect. And that doesn't mean we're going to agree. It just means that I can hear you out and have an idea of where you're coming from and maybe have more data points, more of a vast perspective of what's leading you to do or say or think or feel as you do. So I think it's absolutely necessary and and beyond which I think it's so beautiful to feel that sense of connection at the end of a hard conversation if you're really going in it with an open mind to hear the person out and understand them. The second piece to it is what we say in hypnotherapy terms is closing loops. And so I think if we keep loops open, which means we're keeping this sort of uncomfortable feeling open and we're not addressing it, it's sort of like this lingering uncomfortable elephant in the room that's not being looked at. And there's something really 
healing, powerful, you know, therapeutic about closing a loop and saying, I've had this conversation. I heard them. They heard me. There is a deeper sense of understanding. Hopefully there's connection at the end of it. But if nothing else, we've heard each other out. We can close the loop now rather than sort of leaving it open. And I think the longer we leave these uncomfortable conversations open, these loops open, the more anxiety it creates, the bigger the problem feels, the grander it gets over time. Sometimes you even forget what you were arguing about or the problem itself. And so, you know, I say address it, address it with an open mind, address it with the intention to understand, address it with the end goal to connect, address it to close the loop, if nothing else, so you can be at peace. (laughs) That's my perspective. Yeah. Throw it back to you, Michael. (laughs) Yeah. So for me, when it comes to getting that hardship in your life, that trauma, whatever you want to call it. It is essential. I have not grown exponentially from my successes. I have grown from my failures. I have grown from the hard moments. I have grown from the challenges. They do not feel good. When I get them, I'm like, either I effed up, that sucks. You know, like I live in that, right? I relish in it for a minute. And then I say, okay, what do I do now? How do I win? And I might lose again. All right. I lost again. That didn't work. Let me figure this out. I do a pivot. I don't give up right? We cannot give up. We just have to keep on pushing. If you want something in life, you want something bad enough, you do not give up. You do not put it under the rug and say, okay, well, I can't have it now. Or someone told you that you can't have it. Now you have a limiting belief. You get to decide your own life. And it's a very hard pill to swallow because people, they want easy, they want comfortable. And when they have that moment of hardship and of an uncomfortable moment, They want to run. That's like an instinct. It's scary. I want to run. But I want you to stand there, look that fear in the eye, look whatever is happening in your life in the eye and say, I'm going to beat you. And just remain strong, remain resilient. And you might need some help. You might need a coach, mentor, someone on your team to help you pivot, to help you understand what went on. Ahmad, you said you're helping someone go through some grief, loss of a father. That right there is that same aspect, right? You have lived through it. You get to help people through it. And there are people who have achieved greatness and success in something that you might be going for. So I encourage people to find those people. And if you find those people and they say, hey, you messed up here, don't take it as you can't achieve what they achieve. Understand that that is part of the process. Failure can be part of the process and failure is so powerful. And I don't want people to think that failure is the end of the road. It's just the beginning. So I want to bring this to ST now, and we're going to just have her lead the discussion. Yeah, I want to take a bit of a different approach in the question, Um, more of like understanding you Mm -hmm. and all of you here. It's so awesome to meet you guys. What's a controversial opinion that you have on this world doesn't get spoken about enough that you want to share, even if people are going to send a lot of hate for you? For it, but I, I'm really curious to hear. And even better if it's not something that we've like spoken about today, but just something you believe in. Give us an example before you pass that to someone. I have so many. Um, okay, well, you just spoke about limiting beliefs. I have this belief that not all, but many limiting beliefs actually don't come from like so called what people told us, but rather come from how your brain is currently operating, how your brain thinks, which causes you to behave in certain ways, which like end up having your limiting beliefs. And yes, then people will say things about that. Um, but it's like a cycle. It's really starting in how your brain is is thinking. Okay. Just, Who would you like to leave That's not out? super controversial, yeah. but like mm-hmm. a belief. Um, um, Ahmad, do you want to start? So I think one of the conversations that we're slightly having, but not really willing to lean in on is the destruction that the welfare and entitlement programs of the late 60s did that we're reaping the benefits from in society right now. And when I mean benefits, I say that from the standpoint of the total destruction that was happening. The the ideal that you can make a bargain to say, hey, you know, we'll give you a meager living, but you need to break this home up and make sure that you don't have a, a family unit in here to be able to rear and raise the kids has been devastating on society. Crime rates, the dropouts, teen pregnancy, drug use, homelessness, despair at every level. It has not 
it was supposed to be the war on poverty, but all it did was exacerbate poverty and bring up a whole slew of other things that we didn't even think about. I sit back and you look and see where the origin of a lot of these issues, we've been talking about a lot of them here today, whether you're talking about entitlement and you're talking about these other things. Well, where did that come from? That's the generation of the kids who was a result of those bad decisions from the 60s. Those are grandparents now. And so now we have a trickle down effect of all of these different things. And it's a conversation we're not having enough of. It's happening a little bit more now, but I really think we need to lean in on the idea of really hitting hitting a, a hard reset button on what has worked for society for a long time because no one is happier, no one is richer, and no one is doing better as a result of that policy itself. It has been completely destructive and we just keep putting band-aids over things and throwing money at it when what needs to happen is a total mindset shift. Because what happens is, is there was a mindset that was broken from that time. And so hopefully we can have more conversations on that in the future and find a way to start, you know, teaching the young people, hey, there's a better way to do life. And it doesn't come from just sitting back receiving funds from any governmental entity without putting in work on your own. Yeah, I love that so much. I'm like such a big believer in solving the core issue instead of just putting on a Band-Aid. So I've really, even if it's controversial, I agree with it. Um, Giovanna, what do you have to say? Now, after hearing Ahmad share, I'm like, oh, <laughs> there's, so, there's so many angles. I actually study human rights law as my first degree in school and journalism. So I'm like going through the plethora of all the human rights issues in my mind right now. I'm like, which one do I choose from? <laughs> um <laughs> With that being said, I will go back to actually where I was initially going earlier, and that was actually in the the topic of cheating. And this actually relates in some sense to what you were saying, Ahmad, in, in the deeper core sense of it being about understanding. So I think any problem that shows up in the world, and I'm using cheating as an example, is not just what it is at face value. In other words, people don't just cheat on their partner for the sake of doing it. There's a number of reasons why these things happen. And so to label someone as good or bad for doing what they did, I think is too simple minded. I don't think it's deep enough. We could jump into, you know, something like, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the banality of Eichmann. This was a book written by an SS officer who had served in like the Nazi regime, Second World War. And he was sending all of, you know, the you know, the Jews and, you know, everybody else into these chambers. And so when he was interviewed, he just said, well, I was a piece of the cog. I was just following orders. That was what it was. And so he didn't really necessarily have much of an emotional response to it because for him, he was doing his job right. And for someone that cheats, maybe they think they have a good reason for it too. And for somebody that's creating destruction in the world on an economic or political scale, I think it would be really interesting to sit with them first and have an understanding of what's going on in their mind, in their belief systems, in their values on some deeper scale that makes them think that what they're doing is appropriate. But I guess the piece that's controversial about this is that I wouldn't call anybody bad or wrong. So I don't think a cheater is wrong for cheating the way I don't necessarily think this man that sent all these people to these camps was a bad human being. I think there's something deeper than to just call someone bad or what they're doing is wrong. We can morally understand and ethically understand as human beings that this is not necessarily something, you know, let's say favorable, and this is not good for the rest of humanity. However, to be so simple as to just label someone good or bad, I think is not doing justice. I think we need to understand humans on a much deeper level because we are far more complex than just the actions that we take and we see superficially in the world. So that's my two cents on all of that. (laughs) Yeah. I I love that. I always say most people aren't good or bad because like I do consider Hitler bad, even like he wasn't a cog in the wheel. Right. Um, But I think that like it goes down, it trickles down to like everyday people. Like we label kids good or bad. Like no kid is purposely misbehaving or not doing the right thing in the classroom or on the streets. There's always a reason why. And their behaviors may not be good, but they're not bad. So yeah, Caroline, what do you have to say? I'm just going to mix it up and take it in a whole other direction. (laughs) 
and this is coming from my executive coaching brain, so many people come to me, come to coaching in order to build a business. They want to learn about marketing and selling. I put it to them, a counterintuitive truth that I get a lot of pushback on, which is if you stop networking, you stop marketing, and you stop selling, you will create the most prosperous version of your business possible. Hmm. I don't I think networking, Yeah, like explain. <laughs> I think networking yeah. sucks. Instead, you should be building relationships. And those two take two very different skill sets. I think that selling is not necessary when you're serving, when you're creating a product or service that brings great value. You never have to sell it. You just have to exhibit it. You have to show, give people a taste of it. And then they will buy it if it's for them. So you don't have to sell it. And marketing, you know, do you need to get your product out there for sure? Should it be done in this kind of stupid way that we, so many people do it with social media? No. Social media has its place. Nobody is, I mean, I am consistent and completely on social media, you know, week after week, day after day. But I see it as a tool for legitimizing my business and for people to experience my coaching. Not because I think that someone's going to come and, you know, pay, in any case, my high, high prices for coaching and my commitment that I ask for of six months or more, you know, because uh, of some marketing thing. And nothing annoys me more than these horrible LinkedIn reach outs every day. You know, do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Do you want to raise your clients? I have a million clients at once. And I just feel so bad for people who are falling for those tricks because there must be people who are falling for them or else these people wouldn't be continuously doing it. So I am like, that's my counterintuitive truth. Don't market, don't sell, and don't network. Okay. Build relationships. Build relationships. I'm sure relationships is with all of them. <laughs> Build relationships and create value. Create value. You know, when I was for three decades in luxury fashion, it would not have occurred to me to expect someone to buy anything off the rack without them trying it on. However, somehow when it comes to coaching, we expect to have a 20-minute conversation with someone and for them to say, okay, yes. Instead, I invite them into a deep coaching conversation so they can have an experience of it and so that we can build trust the way Ahmad and Michael have. You know, you say, oh, we're on the same page. Well, it's clearly you guys have been building trust. That's what creates prosperity. That's what creates value. And it takes time. You know, it's not the microwave, as you said, Ahmad. It's the pig in the ground. <laughs> yeah, I will say this. I know Ahmad and I, we had like an hour and a half podcast or interview. And even after we were done recording, him and I talked for like another hour and a half or two hours. It was like, it was crazy. So, and then we were just talking about ideas and things like that. And he actually lives, what, three hours away from me. So we were just like, okay, what can we do? It was that small connection that can build something great. And I have found in my career, value is more important than any marketing campaign, social media ad or whatever. It plays a role, but it's not as significant as people think, right? You're better off building something, showing people who you are. One of the reasons why I created the podcast, why I do so much. I mean, seven days a week, you're getting something from me, whether you like it or not, it's coming out. So that is what I do, what I have built. And it's not for everyone. Some people think, well, you know, I'm just going to do the least amount of work and they want the maximum amount of results. But we do have to sometimes get into the mindset that if it worked for someone else, it doesn't mean it's going to work for you magically. Great example, Alex Hermosi. He did all of these Alex Hermosi style clips with the, with the emojis and stuff like that. Everyone started copying him. Right. If we look at shorts today and reels today, Alex Hermosi style clips are irrelevant because they have already outgrown that. So he was a person who started something. Everyone thought, oh, we just have to do what he did. We can be successful. They tried it. They're not successful. 
So you do have to have some type of uniqueness. You have to see what's coming next and then just be ahead of the crowd. So Can I just going- add to that oh, yeah, go about what it. you said about Alex Ramosi? I yeah. think the reason why his things works was not because of his emojis and his style of editing. It's because he has a provided value, whether with his books or in his other mm-hmm. things that that just gave him like the push or mm-hmm. like it helped him. But like going back to like what Caroline said, like you first need that value and you first need people to really be exper- experienced and then like everything else will actually work. But Michael, what's your controversial? Oh, I forgot. I didn't say it. Maybe I'm running away from it because there's two, <laughs> there's two I can go down. One's like a mindset OD. One's definitely a part of this conversation. So I think I'm going to keep it relevant both, to both, the conversation. Both. <laughs> you want both? Love All right. It. Yes. All right. I'll give you both. All right. So the first is the Wednesday episode that happened before this episode. You can listen to it and then you're going to understand what I'm talking about. So there's two types of ways of thinking and mindset. You can have an ascending mindset or a descending mindset. So an ascending mindset is you are low on the totem pole, you have low value, but you can build your value. You can ascend. A descending type of mindset is that you are entitled, you have your value, you think you're all that in a bag of potato chips, and you are owed the world that you don't have to do anything for it. You have a descending mindset. So you actually have no value, but you think you have a higher value. So I say that when you have an ascending type of mindset, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, but it's more so of who is born with value, all right? So this is going to be the controversial stuff. Who is born with value, men or women? Women are typically born with more value than men. Men have to build themselves up. Not saying that women don't build themselves up, controversial. So we do have to understand that. Great example. You are 18 years old, going to club. A guy raises their hand, says, hey, anyone want to go home and sleep with me? Mm. No one. (laughs) 18-year-old girl goes into the club. Hey, anyone wants to sleep with me? She has a line full of guys. So we look at the value. When was that value given? So that is a controversial uh, topic. I go into detail in the Wednesday episode on that, but that is just one of them. The second is the concept of a broken family and that it's okay. I understand why people can be in broken families, especially if it's a bad situation, toxic, abusive substance abuse and things like that, it's actually better to get out of those relationships. But to get out of a relationship because you're not happy or because you don't feel fulfilled, that's a personal issue. You should do the work. You shouldn't just break up a marriage. Marriage is until death do you part, not until you don't feel like doing your part. I did a whole episode and I'm I'm, I'm gonna put someone on blast. I had a guest on the episode. She did what, it was a controversial issue. I will throw my guests on blast if they say something incorrectly. They have their own opinion and things like that. But then the next Wednesday episode, she's on blast, clips all in the episode. And this is the mindset of what I'm talking about in the controversial issue. So those are two big ones and it can lead to further discussion. But um, I don't know if you want to go into it, SD. Oh, I'd love to. (laughs) I I do too. (laughs) Well, 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 for the sake of this, because because we still have to get to Giovanna and I know Ahmad is, is running out of time. So I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. If you're OK with that, ST, can we pass that to Giovanna to ask her a question? Yes, let's do it. And right. if we have time to come back. All right. Maybe at the end, if Ahmad has to go. <laughs> That's a cool podcast. That's a cool yeah, podcast there. it is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> totally is. <laughs> Okay, so I'm actually just going to ask because I personally feel so strong myself, of course, it being my work about the importance of relationships and human connection and authentically connecting, conscious communication, all these things. I want to know to you all, what does actual deep connection mean to you? What does that look like? And why do you all think it's so important for yourselves? Okay, who do you want to start off with? Uh, I feel like I need to let them formulate thoughts. <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, man, I, I can go in any time. I'm, I'm an expert at podcasting, I think. I don't know. Okay, Michael, why don't you start us and then maybe we'll pop it along. Okay, so just uh, clarify your question one more time for me and I'm going to go hit it. So what does human connection mean to you and why do you think it's so important in your life or in people's lives? 
in so, life. Yeah. So I think in our world today, we think that human connection is one of those things that are are optional, but we don't understand that everything that is within our reach is someone's else's doing the roads we drive on the house we live in the power when we turn on the lights the uh, car we drive the gas we get at the gas station the groceries we buy at the grocery store that was because of someone else so community plays a big role and to form a connectiveness between people is essential so we need people in order to survive we have just become accustomed to having things given to us because there's a barter and trade system now. So I can give money to the local grocery store and I can get the foods that I need for my family. Instead of me having to have a garden, start everything, I don't have to do that. So there's an, a different aspect to how people operate in the realm of thinking of community. Now, when it comes to personal relationships, because I think that's also an aspect to the question, there are going to be people in your life that are going to be seasonal. So someone who you vibe with today might not be someone you vibe with tomorrow. Great example, high school. How many of your high school friends do you still speak with? For me, zero. Not saying that each of you have the same scenario situation, but for me, I have decided to separate myself from them because I was going on a path that not many of them want to go on. It's a path of, again, turmoil, hardship, and a clear unknowingness of what is going to be the end result. Yes, I'm optimistic and I'm hoping at some level that I, you know, I reach there. And even if I don't reach there, at least I can say I dare. I dare to defy the odds. I dare to uh, do something great in my life. And you have to surround yourself with people who have that same type of mentality. And you might find someone who has that type of mentality, but then maybe 10 years, they seem to have died, like that mentality died. So they kind of are not as ambitious anymore. And I say, get rid of them. So you could be a best friend with someone for 15, 20 years. I don't care how long. If they are not keeping up with you, leave them behind. That is my hot take. I know it's not a popular one, but you cannot have anchors in your life. You have to have people that are going to see your worth, who are going to want to see you succeed as much as they want to succeed. And if you don't have those two, it's a mixture for failure. Oh, I mean, yeah, beautiful. I, I would love to hear, so I love what you shared, and I would love to hear why do you think it's so important to be connected with these people? So the people that you really do resonate with, the people that you really like, you know, you find you bond with, why do you think that's so important? If you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. Beautiful. Love it. Okay. I'm going to pass it on to you, Ahmad. Uh-oh. I dig where, where Michael is coming from on, on a multitude of levels. And, and I see we do kind of share a little bit of, you know, who's in your life. I want to take it in a little bit different direction when you talk about human connection. And for me, human connection goes in three tiers for me. And it's love, respect, and gratitude. When I'm going into, even if it's even if it's a quick introduction or whatever, I'm looking for those elements, a combination of all three or some version of those with any interaction. Even if it's an eight-year-old at the grocery store, an old lady coming out of, you know, the, the auto shop, it doesn't matter. I'm looking for those components because I am looking to create the light between the two of us. And so I want that because, you know, a lot of the times when, you know, we're mentioning about like everyone wants to do things on your own. You know, I did this by myself and, you know, no one helped me. I dug it out of the mud. And it's just like, first of all, you're lying. No one does anything alone. Second of all, it's like, these are all first world issues because coming up, you needed a whole community to get a whole lot of things done. And you still need it now. We just try to put it in different blocks and just take too much credit because unfortunately there's a lot of narcissism in the world where you think that like you actually created something as grand as building a home by yourself. And that's just not how it works. So for me, human connection comes down to those three things, love, respect, and gratitude, because I want there to be that connection to where it's reciprocal, like where we're both getting something out of this. Because for there to be love, there's, it's got to come from both ways. For there to be respect, it's got to come from both ways. For there to be the gratitude, it's like when they, when we leave one another, I want to walk away saying, wow, I ran into them for 42 seconds and I felt like in my life I needed that. 
And I'm grateful for that moment happening, even if it was that short. Someone who checked your groceries out, someone who's, you know, at the, you know, at an electronic store, that interaction with the salesperson, he's like, man, that guy was amazing. And you don't know why you feel that way, but you do and you know you needed it. And so for me, that's where the human connection comes from. And so I'm grateful for that. I would love to just hear when you say I needed that. Is there a way you could put that? Because I could sense something shift in you, like that thing, that connection, that 42 seconds of a conversation with someone. What is that for you that you think you needed or that we all need? Well, I mean, without going too spiritual with the situation, I think when we awaken, I think we, we yearn for community and we yearn to grow the community, even if it's those little bitty moments. Because at every point in life, we have so many different thoughts going through our head. And it's just like, you know, today's been pretty rough. And man, just reveal something to me that I don't know I need. Because I mean, what is a blessing? A blessing sometimes is what you don't know you need. And when it shows up, you can't do without it. And so I look for those everywhere in every little interaction, whether it's crossing someone at a mailbox or whatever. I think somewhere... It's a mechanism within us. It's a yearning to where maybe for that day, you're lacking a little bit of love, lacking a little bit of gratitude, lacking a little bit of something in your life. And that person feels that gap for that quick moment. And you're just like, "Mm, just what I needed. Just like getting a cold drink of water and it quenches your thirst. And you're just like, wow, that's the best drink. That's the best cup of water I've ever had. And it's like, is it? For now, it is. And so I look at that when I interact with people because I'm looking for those opportunities to be a blessing to them and then be a blessing to me. And everyone walks away saying, I feel better because I ran into that woman or ran into that guy. Love it. And I'm going to jump to Carolyn in just a second, just to add to what you're saying. It's funny because in the research I've done on human connection, they've literally drawn, so it's neuroscientist, Dr. Andrew Huberman. He's literally drawn the connection between human connection and food and water and says that our bodies actually need connection just as much as we do food and water, and we get equally satiated from one as we do the other. So if we lack that food and water and nutrients in our life, then we often look for it in connection. And if we lack it in connection, then we often look for it in food, which is why a lot of people turn to their fridge to eat when they're actually lacking really meaningful quality connection. So it's just funny that you brought that up. I'm like, yep, yeah, what you're saying is is in the neuroscience research. <laughs> uh, Carolyn, I'm going to jump right to you. Well, Andrew Huberman um, stole my thunder <laughs> because, you know, you asked about, you asked about deep, that's, I heard deep connection rather than human connection yeah. per se. And what mm-hmm. immediately landed for me is deep connection is our nourishment. It's the nourishment of the soul. So what Huberman says really resonates with me because really it's the food for the soul and deep connection is good food. You know, so many of us have focused on making our actual food nourishment as the best that it can be. We're eating organic, we're eating really healthy foods, and yet the nourishment for our soul is still junk food. To Michael's point about you cannot have anchors, don't show that kind of discernment when it comes to the connections. And I'm going to say that there's, for me, there's three kinds of deep connections. One is to others, something we've really focused on as a group. The other is to myself. What is my deep connection with myself? Or rather, how deep, how authentic, how clean, how nourishing? is that connection. And then the third is with nature. I cannot do without. So wonderful friends, wonderful community, wonderful clients, wonderful children does not take the place entirely for me of my need for deep connection with nature and the nourishment that my soul gets from that. It's probably why I'm an endurance athlete because, you know, I, I spend so much time out in that world. So that's, That's how I see deep connection. I really love that you had mentioned those three pieces, Carolyn, because I think they're all essential. And, you know, even what I'm writing in my book, it always goes full circle back to the relationship with ourself. 
you know, if we don't have that deep understanding, if we don't get curious, we're not conscious, we're not clear within ourselves, then how can we have those deep connections with other people? And also, how would we even know that nature is valuable or nourishing for us if we don't have that awareness within self? So I love that you brought up all those pieces because I do think they all make up, you know, what quality connection, deep connection actually looks like for sure. ST. Yeah. So for me, deep connection honestly really resonates with me because like if you ask me what I enjoy besides for traveling or like nature, not in the same way you, but I do love nature. It will be deep connection with another human being and and specifically like deep conversations going really, really deep on a topic and just connecting and hearing their perspectives and debating and disagreeing and whatever else it is. And I think that a lot of times like we talk about connection of like doing fun things with other people. And I'm all for it. Like go have fun and you want to like you want to spend your time in other situations with other people, but there is nothing that will replace having a deep conversation with a person. Like I was literally thinking, right? Like we spend almost two hours together and we could have like done an activity together. We might have learned about each other a lot, but nothing as much as like having this deep conversation that we have here. That's first of all. And second of all, I think that At the same time, we also can have deep relationships with different people or different things because sometimes we like, we want one person to fill everything, but we need different people to help us and to support us, whether it's in business or it's in sports or specific areas of our lives to really get like the full effect of what we can have from deep relationships. Yeah, that depth shows up in so many different spaces and it doesn't need to just be one person offering the whole spectrum of it. We can find depth in so many different ways. I think that's sort of the beauty, ST, of, you know, talking to a plethora of different people, a variety of different people, because then we find that we can have different types of conversations and go into different depths with different people about different things and learn a variety of things from them too. And that doesn't mean that one is any less deep or connecting than the other. They're just, they're just showing up differently, but certainly. Yeah. I love it. Um, I think we all responded. Yes. And we did a great job at that. Everyone had a piece of the pie and now we're going to begin to wrap up. We had a great conversation from start to here. We're going to start with Ahmad and Ahmad, like I said, after you give us your final thoughts, your final words, and then plug, you can boogie on out. You have responsibilities. All right. You're a busy man. So uh, just hit it when it, whenever you're ready. All right. So any particular things on the closing thoughts, closing quote, you know, love all you guys. Is that, is you that get to decide this is America. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Donald Glover style. Okay. <laughs> um, first and foremost, uh, Michael, thank you for having me on this platform. Thank you to all the guests, Carolyn ST, Giovanna, you all have been awesome. As I close out, I'll, I'll close out with a quote and I will use one of them that I, that I've used a few times as we're talking about community. We're talking about conversation. We're talking about complacency. We're talking about culture. We're talking about being game changers in the world. I said this at a homegoing celebration one time and I don't know who to attribute it to, but it's one of the greatest things I've ever heard. And it says, ask not how many people will mourn you when you die. But how many people were better off because you lived? And I want to leave everyone with that from the standpoint of whatever your profession is, all of you all out there making some great and amazing things happen. Lean in on that. Whatever that looks like, give it, give an extra 5, 10, 15, 20 percent. See what a new season for you looks like. Go ahead and stretch out. Go ahead and roll into that cocoon and come out and be a new butterfly in this season. Make something amazing happen. You guys are doing great things. I look forward to catching up with every single one of you in different areas of life, hopefully stay here stage with you outside of this platform on the podcast here. Love you all. And thank you all for having me. All right. Perfect. And where can people find you? Uh, AhmadVital.com and AhmadVital on every platform. There's no alias out there. It's just me, Uh, Instagram, Facebook, website. All the books can be found under that same platform as well. My books are on 33 different digital platforms right now. So Feel free to catch whatever digital bookstore you want to catch up with. My publisher made uh, my newest book available um, on all those different platforms. So I'm grateful for that. And hopefully you all can go out and get a copy and we'll uh, definitely have another time to discuss that as well. 
Excellent. Okay. And last time I'm going to ask, did you want a boogie? Did I want a what? Boogie. Head on out. Okay. You got to like, you got to, got to leave. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I, I do have to step on out there. I told my youth pastor, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to five, five fifteen, and uh-huh. you know, cause he wanted to, he, we have a meeting we're going into, so it'll be all good and we'll deal with that when we get there. But sometimes some moments are worth uh, embracing in the time and you don't get to redo that, but I can't make up my time where I'm going. So okay. um, you all are valuable and I wanted to make sure and embrace and respect this time with you all. Right. And the reason I keep asking is because I'm very respectful of people's time because I understand my time is very valuable too. So I just don't want to waste people's time for no apparent reason. So if I keep like bugging you because it's because of that, I don't want you to feel like, Michael, you held me hostage for an extra 30 minutes and you said, you promised me, Michael. All right. I'll be out by 45. I said, I said, yes, sir. I said, I, (laughs) I said, yes, sir. You are just in it to win it. And I love your ambition. I love your dedication to this. So appreciate you. And I'll definitely put all those links in the description box below. Let's head over to ST. Yes. I think that we spoke about a lot of amazing things here today, but it's all really nice to talk if we don't actually take action. So I think that every person listening um, should just pick one thing that they're going to do because of this, whether it's having a hard conversation, whether it's learning about a different culture, whether it's thinking about community in a different way, or even just having continued conversations about what we spoke about, then this time won't be wasted and you'll actually have done something and done something with it. And where can people find you? Yes, people can find me at Life Picks University on your favorite platform. My favorite is TikTok, Life Picks University, that's P-I-X or LifePicksUniversity.com. Thank you guys. This was really fun. And I really got enjoy like getting to speak to every single one of you. Mm -hmm. And you said something early on, you said that we could have did something together as a group and spent some time together. But the thing about like having a conversation like this, that's recorded and it's going to be on the internet is that we get to share it with so many more people that are going to be able to resonate on such a deeper level. And I'm not saying that we're not going to appreciate this more than everyone else. But the fact that a podcast is a podcast, it's about a conversation that has already happened. And it's a conversation you can listen to again and again and again. Being a little sentimental here, sometimes, you know, like I have a child, he's one. Sometimes I'll have a video of him and I'm like, I, like I'll record him doing something crazy, uh, climbing, throwing something, jumping, laughing, smiling. Sometimes throughout my day, because I do work a lot, I will just go on my phone, I'll check out that video for two minutes and then that's what I need for my recharge. And I say, that was what I needed. So I look at something that has happened in the past, a conversation, a moment. That is what we created together, a moment that can be on repeat for everyone to listen to, to watch again and again and again, and to find something new with each new turn. Let's get into Carolyn. What is your final thoughts, words? And uh, of course, at the end of that, tell people where they can find you. So I think one of the things that I've noticed doing this group podcast is what the person before you says really influences what you're going to say. And I, I can't help but be, be moved by and, and touched by what SD said. Forget about what I was going to say. I'm going to double down and say, look, knowing for the people who listen, don't fall for the trap of feeling that consuming is changing your lives. Great. Listen to the podcast, but knowing is not equal to doing. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? This has been such a rich time. There's been so many offers. Take action because the world isn't changed by your words. The world is changed by your example. So what are you going to be an example of? What are you going to be a stand for? That's what I want to put out there. I also want to thank each one of you. You really elevated me. You elevated my thinking for bringing this really rich group together. And I'm easy to find. CarolynMabubi.com, my website, is the best place to go. I have a free download if you know you want to do some work on your own of self-coaching. And otherwise, easy to find on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn as Carolyn Mabubi Coach. Whenever I work with you, Carolyn, it's like you're a flower. It's like you bloom. So in the beginning, you're just like the bud. And then eventually you turn into this wonderful blossom. It's just like, whoa, like that was hiding in front of us. So like, if you even look at our interview together, 
and you watch this one, you have the same mannerisms as that. So watch that episode with Carolyn, the initial interview, and then this group episode again, and you'll see that she kind of like just transforms. So energy has that power. So you can feel that energy with people and then you resonate. So I can tell, hopefully, that this group was uh, powerful and it was something that was going to be enriching for not just you, but for everyone involved. And then let's get into the last piece of the puzzle, Giovanna. So in true nature, I want to thank you, of course, Michael and everybody else that has taught me something new, shared something new today, multitude of things got me thinking. And I always feel this sort of jittery high after I finish these talks, like, you know, I'm just energized, which I love. And what I would like to end off with, and I'm really going full circle here with what I started with, and that is that I truly believe that the quality of life of our lives is based on the quality of our relationships. And so even what we're doing here today, we are building new relationships with each other. And, you know, sharing it out into the world is also building new relationships with people. And I think these types of conversations are the things that move us and the things that inspire us and, you know, fill our cups. And if we can have more of them in a day and have more of these connections of like depth and authenticity, I think that goes such a long way. And it has such a beautiful butterfly effect in essence with everybody we come into contact with. So that's my two cents. Thank you so much. You guys can find me at, on Facebook or on LinkedIn at Giovanna Elias and on Instagram, you can find me at Elias. So slightly different there. I'm really looking forward to sharing my new book with you all. It's coming out in the fall, but pre-sales are already open so you guys can get your hands on it. So thank you. <laughs> and all exciting things happening in our lives. And I will be throwing all of the links so you can easily find them in the description box below, including websites, social medias, any books that they have. Because I want you to not only just stay a part of coaching a session, I want you to understand that coaching is more than just one person. And I created coaching in session, not because of I wanted to just simply build value, but because I understood something about coaching. Not everyone is going to be everyone's cup of tea. I don't want to be everyone's cup of tea because then that means I'm conforming. So I want to be who I want to be. And I want to have the clients who see my life and they say, that's respectable. I can be a part of that. And each one here, each guest here, they have that it. They have that different type of personality, that flair, maybe shy, maybe outgoing, maybe curious, maybe assertive. And you say, I love that. And that is where coaching shines is that there's so many different flavors. You're not going to go to the ice cream shop and keep on getting vanilla. You're going to try pineapple upside down cake. You're going to try maybe an orange sherbet. And that is the joy of life, the variety. What we did today was not give you just a blanket conversation of one simple topic, but we brought in a plethora of mindsets and we evolved our conversation from where we began talking about conversation, conformity, community, and culture. Because if we think about our conversation, we had four strangers, basically, because they kind of knew me, come in in an episode of a podcast and leave the podcast saying, I think I found a friend. So I want to thank you all for being a part of this group three episode of Coaching in Session, the last one of 2023. Next year, there's only going to be two. I would like to thank everyone for watching group three episode of Coaching in Session. That conversation was full of twists and turns, and it was a builder for sure, because as we started to grow and get comfortable, our true feelings emerged, and we really dive deep into our mindsets. And I think that's so important as coaches that we understand that our mindset is powerful and our opinion is powerful, but it doesn't mean we cannot have a respectful conversation. And we always bring on coaches who know how to be cordial, who know how to be respectful. But then at some level, we can tell that there is some difference. There is some tension. And I'm not sure if you could have felt that tension along the way. But what I can tell you is that a little bit of tension can be a good thing because it teaches you that we're not trying to simply conform and make everyone like us. We have our belief, we have our life, and we know how to dance amongst everyone, even if we're from different walks of life, different cultures, different communities, or different beliefs and mindsets. Because at the end of the day, we're all people. At the end of the day, we can all come together 
and be friends and have a great conversation. And that is what we had today. So I encourage you to share this episode. I encourage you to follow all these wonderful coaches that we're on today because what you're going to gain from them is just another piece of the puzzle, a piece that is missing in your life. And when you accumulate enough pieces, if you are not where you want to be, eventually you're going to find that the finished product is only one piece away. I would like to thank everyone for watching Coaching in Session, and I encourage everyone to follow these wonderful guests, Carolyn Mabubi, Ahmad Vital, S.T. Rappaport, and Giovanna Elias.